still ahead. October 30th, 1975 was an unseasonably cold night in Greenwich, Connecticut. It was also mischief night, the night before Halloween. Eggs, soap, and shaving cream were the weapons of choice for the teenagers of this privileged community, one of the wealthiest in the country. In the elite enclave of Bellhaven, a gated neighborhood of about 40 homes on the coast of Long Island Sound, Dorothy Moxley spent the evening painting the trim around the windows of her second floor master bedroom. Her husband David, a managing partner at one of Manhattan's most prestigious consulting firms, was in Atlanta on a business trip. Their two children, 17-year-old John and 15-year-old Martha, had each been out with friends since just after dusk. It was a quiet night for Dorothy until a noise shattered the stillness sometime between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. I heard this commotion of voices. Um, they weren't adults, they weren't little kids, they were probably teenage voices. And I don't know how many voices, and I don't remember what they were saying, but it was enough yelling or talking excitedly or doing something because it made me stop what I was doing and look out the window. And of course I couldn't see anything. The commotion coincided with other noises in the neighborhood. Sounds that seemed strange, even for mischief night. Dogs barked furiously, whined, whimpered, uh, and generally behaved in ways that they hadn't ever behaved before, according to their owners. Having put down her brush to look out the window, Dorothy decided to stop painting and wait in the TV room for her children to return. I didn't really get alarmed until... I guess John came home. And then I started thinking, now where is she? My mom told me that Martha wasn't home when I got home and I was like, you know, good. You know, it's, it's, it's about time that I'm home on time when I said I'm gonna be home and you know, let her get in a little hot water. A radiant girl with an exuberant personality, Martha had blossomed in the years since her family had moved from San Francisco to Connecticut. She had a really cute girlish figure, and uh, she had a sense of style in her clothes, and she was very confident. She, she really had a lot, great deal of confidence. From the beginning, she was very friendly. She fit right in, always smiled, very nice, always kind. It wasn't the type of person you could just like. At the end of ninth grade, after just one year in her new town, Martha was voted the girl with the best personality. If someone had asked Martha the morning of October 30th if she was happy in Greenwich, she would have said yes, she loved living in Greenwich. Um, everyone was good to us. Everything was good. But as mischief night slipped into Halloween morning, Martha Moxley still had not come home. Alarmed, her mother began frantically phoning neighbors. A friend of Martha's reported having seen her last at the home of one of Greenwich's richest and most famous families, the Skakels. The widower Rushton Skakel and his seven children were well known because of their relatives. Back in 1950, Rushton's sister Ethel had married a 25-year-old law student named Bobby Kennedy. I remember being around them as kids and people treated them a little differently you'd hear kids whisper there, they're part of the Kennedys. Martha Moxley had been with two of the Skakel boys, 15-year-old Michael and 17-year-old Tommy, earlier that evening. But when her mother called the Skakel house in the early hours of October 31st, she was told that Martha was no longer there. My mom woke me up two, three o'clock in the morning, said Martha wasn't home. She was very fr frightened, you know, it was very much out of the ordinary for her. She said she'd call all over the place. So she asked me to go out and drive around to see if I could find her. And so I drove around Bellhaven and really didn't come across anything. Soon after he returned home, his mother called the police. 
At 3.48 a.m. on October 31st, 1975, was the first call made to the Greenwich Police Station. An officer arrived at the Moxley home a few minutes later. He searched the house and the potting shed in the backyard and quickly scanned the rest of the lawn with a flashlight. But he found nothing out of the ordinary. Though panicked, Dorothy remained certain that her daughter would soon come home. This was, after all, Greenwich, one of the safest towns in the country. Waiting on the window seat that looked out onto the front yard, she finally fell asleep. Bellhaven was a small neighborhood where news traveled fast. By late that morning, everyone knew Martha was missing, and they were afraid. It was an unfamiliar feeling in a gated community with its own private security force. Several neighbors now joined Dorothy's desperate vigil. Others banded together to scour the neighborhood for some sign of the missing girl. I got up, I got dressed, I got my sister Holly. We called a couple other friends and made a plan to team up and go out and look for her. Hoping that maybe she just got together with some people, grabbed some sleeping bags and were sleeping out in one of the yards. Shortly after noon, another neighbor, Sheila McGuire, cut across the Moxley's property to join the search for Martha. The house was on her right. The yard sloped down to her left. And directly in front of her, beneath the branches of a large pine tree, lay a crumpled and bloody body. Sheila McGuire came to the door and said that she, she was hysterical, she was crying, and said that she had found Martha. She thought she'd, she'd found Martha. And I said, well, is she all right? And she said, she didn't think so. And so that's when my friends decided I shouldn't go and look. And this one friend said she would go and look and make sure that it was Martha and that she was all right. And she came back in the house in just a few minutes and said, well, it was Martha, but that she was dead. I sat in a chair in the living room and I was afraid to move because I knew if I moved I, I would fall apart. Greenwich police officers arrived minutes later. It was just a bloody mess. It was uh, very much like if you had taken a pumpkin and, and just smashed it so that you really couldn't tell it was a pumpkin later. We didn't know what color hair she had because everything was red from her shoulders up. In pieces at the scene lay an unusual weapon, a golf club. A six iron, much like this one. The killer had apparently assaulted the girl the night before, bludgeoning her with the club until it shattered, then using the broken end of the shaft to stab her through the neck. She was beaten so badly that the pathologist who performed the autopsy was unable to designate one of her many head wounds to be the actual wound that caused her death. John Moxley was at varsity football practice when he heard the horrible news. I was changing my clothes. The coach came up and told me that something had happened at home. My parents wanted me home right away. When I got home, um, I couldn't even pull up the driveway. There was police cars everywhere, an ambulance, yellow tape. You know, it was, you know, like a scene out of a police movie. Instead of using a regular telephone, a Greenwich police officer had called in his report over an open car radio. As a result, within minutes of the discovery of Martha Moxley's body, Serene Bellhaven had become a media circus. It was the chaotic beginning of an investigation that would continue to haunt the Greenwich police and the town itself for many years to come. As Dorothy Moxley sat in shock, just across the street, the home of her famous neighbors was abuzz. Rushton Skakel Sr. had cut short an out-of-state pleasure trip and was making a hasty return to Bellhaven. A New York City lawyer had arrived at the house and was telling friends of the Skakel children that they would not be available for socializing that day. The murder of Martha Moxley would soon become another scar on the name of a family that had long been steeped in controversy. Coming up next on American Justice, Ethel Kennedy's nephew, Tommy Skakel, becomes a suspect as the Greenwich police begin their search for Martha's killer. Jeep 
Grand Cherokee sponsors Biography. Legendary people who lived extraordinary lives. Biography on A&E. Sponsored in part by Jeep Grand Cherokee with legendary off-road capability. Jeep Grand Cherokee comes equipped with our most advanced four-wheel anti-lock braking system ever. And that's good news for everyone. Check out some of our biggest offers of the year now during National Jeep Month. Ants, they think they can march into your home anytime. And soon they're living La Vida Loca. Call 1-800-Terminex and let our convenient outside service stop the bugs. Hasta la vista, Ants. 1-800-Terminex. No bugs, no hassles. A tradition, a celebration, an a and &E special live presentation. Join Keith Lockhart, the Boston Pops Esplanade Orchestra, and special guest Don McLean, Linda Eder, and Arturo Sandoval for a star-spangled symphony of music and light. Pops goes the fourth, July 4th on A&D. An A&D original movie presentation. Mountain pop. The prize was worth millions. The obstacles were infinite. The machine is no good. Jeremy Irons, Michael Gambon. Doesn't work. Failure was not an option. It does work. I built it. Longitude. July 9th on A&D. <laughs> All right, maggot. Let's talk about your lunch money. Yeah. Your lunch money. Oh, this is the five bucks that I owe you for today, and this should cover the rest of the week. Wow. You're the man. That was painless. WhyGigo.com, where you take control of buying a car. Research it, finance it, buy it. Gigo.com, we've got this car thing down. Mm, with just one wish, if I could change my whole world around. Day inside or summer all year long. If I could speak in color, what magic I'd reveal. Is this what peaceful looks like? Do you know how colors feel? Say hello, where to go, whatever you want to know. Ask how, ask now, ask Sherwin Williams. And now back to American Justice here on AME. On November 4th, 1975, a grieving Greenwich, Connecticut turned out for Martha Moxley's funeral. The vivacious high school sophomore had been found beaten to death five days before. A savage murder that had shattered the sense of security shared by residents of the wealthy community. Among the hundreds of mourners who gathered at First Lutheran Church that day was the nephew of Bobby and Ethel Kennedy. 17-year-old Tommy Skakel. What few at the funeral knew was that the teenager had become a leading suspect in the murder of Martha Moxley. The Greenwich Police Department's first major murder investigation in almost 30 years began beneath a pine tree on the west side of the Moxley property. There, on the afternoon of October 31st, a neighbor had discovered the body of 15-year-old Martha, who had been missing since the night before. Steve Carroll, a 21-year veteran, was one of the first officers on the scene. They'd seen a lot of dead bodies, seen people blow their brains out and uh, drown and that kind of thing, but never homicide. From the beginning, the department's inexperience left its investigation open to criticism. Within minutes after Martha's body was discovered, a crowd of neighbors, reporters, and other policemen had descended on the Moxley's yard. Former LAPD detective Mark Furman, himself no stranger to controversial investigations, has recently written a book highly critical of how the Greenwich police handled this high-profile case. The crime scene wasn't secure. A crime scene doesn't know if those are cop's shoes or citizen shoes. You know. Uh, ten uniformed cops standing within 15 feet of the body is a contaminated, messed up, chaotic scene. Lacking the resources to handle a violent crime, the department had to call in the Connecticut State Medical Examiner. He was unable to make it to Greenwich Hospital to perform the autopsy 
until the following day and never viewed the murder scene itself. Because of the delay, the results could only narrow the time of death to a seven and a half hour period between 9.30 p.m. on October 30th and five the next morning. But to critics of the investigation, the department's biggest blunder was its inability, some would say its refusal, to accept that such a horrific crime could have been committed by one of Greenwich's own. By the afternoon of Martha Moxley's funeral, detectives had largely pieced together the events of the young girl's last night. The story began around 6.30, when Martha headed out with a group of friends, armed with eggs, soap, and shaving cream. It was mischief night. Martha asked, could I go out with these kids? I thought, oh, sure, go ahead, that's fine. After Martha walked out the door that night, I never did see her again. Around nine, Martha and her friends, Helen X and Jeff Byrne, ended up at the Skakels Bellhaven Mansion. They were greeted at the door by 15-year-old Michael. They stayed in the house very briefly and then left the house, went out and sat into a Lincoln automobile that was parked in the driveway for the purpose of listening to music. They remained in that automobile a short time and were then joined by another Skakel brother, Thomas, who was 17 years old at the time. Martha had gotten to know the Skakel boys that summer. She had even mentioned Tommy in her diary, writing that he was interested in her. Now, as Martha sat between Tommy and Michael in the front seat, Tommy began flirting with her. According to Martha's friends, who were in the back seat at the time, she resisted his advances. The information was that at some time while they were in the car, Thomas Gakel placed his hand upon either the thigh or the knee of Martha Moxley. Martha pushed his hand away and sometime thereafter he replaced it and put it on the thigh or the knee a second time and she again pushed his hand away. Then around 9.15, two of the other Skakel teenagers, John and Rushton Jr., along with their cousin Jim, came out of the house. And they say that the kids have to get out of the car because they're going to take their cousin home to Cliffdale Road. Michael reportedly volunteered to go with them. When he invited Martha to come along, she said no and got out of the car. The four boys drove off. Now that left Helen X and Jeff Byrne, according to both of them, they immediately left to go to their home, leaving then Tom Skakel and Martha Moxley in the driveway. Martha's two friends would later tell police that as they walked away, they saw Tommy pushing Martha, who fell to the ground and out of sight. In talking to Tommy several times after and referring to uh, what Helen said, uh, we asked him if uh, Martha got hurt when, uh, when he pushed her. And uh, he kind of draws a blank and he said, no, no, I, I didn't push Martha. Martha didn't get hurt. Instead, Tommy told police he had left Martha around 9.30 and gone inside to work on a report about Abraham Lincoln for school. But when detectives checked this story with his teacher, they discovered that there had been no such assignment. It was sometime between 9.30 and 10 that Martha's mother, Dorothy, was startled by a strange commotion outside her window. Others in the neighborhood heard a chorus of dogs suddenly start furiously barking. With autopsy results unable to pinpoint the time of the murder, Police publicly indicated that these noises marked the moment when they believed Martha was assaulted. Evidence at the crime scene suggested that sexual activity, possibly a struggle, may have played a part in the attack. Her jeans and her panties will pull down to uh, just below her knees. And there was one uh, smudge on the inside of her thigh as if it were a handprint that it would appear that maybe somebody tried to open her legs. Tommy Skakel, it seemed, had both the opportunity and possible motive to have assaulted Martha Moxley that night. He also had access to the murder weapon. Leaving the Skakel home the day Martha's body was discovered, 
police noticed a golf club bearing the insignia of a former touring pro named Tony Penna. It was the same brand as the shattered six iron found at the murder scene. Forensic testing would determine that the two clubs came from the exact same set. After thoroughly canvassing the neighborhood, police concluded that the Skakels were the only residents who owned that particular brand. They found a matching set to the murder weapon inside the Skakel house and all the bells should have gone off right then. Yet despite all the evidence that at the time seemed to point toward Tommy Skakel, detectives focused their investigation elsewhere, away from Greenwich's most famous family. We believe that it was somebody from the outside that did it, not one of those nice people from Belhaven. Though the murder weapon was a powerful piece of evidence, Greenwich police realized that merely tying it to the Skakels was not enough to make an arrest. The Skakel kids often practiced chipping and putting in their backyard. Rather than putting the clubs away when they were done, they would just leave them on the ground until the next time they played. On its own, then, the broken six iron was no smoking gun. The family would simply claim that any outsider could have picked it up off the lawn. Coming up, the Skakel family stonewalls the investigation, and the Greenwich Police Department turns its attention to other suspects. That's next when American Justice returns here on E&E. You know, it's times like these I think about the Wide Track Grand Prix. Its speed-sensitive steering gives you road-gripping control in even the tightest corners. Uh oh Get $1,500 cash back or 0.9% APR GMAC financing on any new 2000 Grand Prix. The Wide Track Grand Prix. Wider is better. For additional offers, log on to GMTicketToRide.com. Their eyes locked. He began to kiss her. Suddenly, she pushed him away. What is wrong? He asked. Oh, Nick. My portfolio is totally unbalanced. Three of my mutual funds are underperforming. And I've been far too concentrated in small cap stock. You can always tell an investor who's had a Schwab portfolio consultation. It's an objective evaluation that tells you how you're doing and whether you could do better. She spun around. If you don't understand portfolio allocation, Nick, you don't understand me. Wait, I love you. Nothing is more precious than your eyesight. That's why everyone should wear sunglasses, prescription or otherwise. Get them from lens crafters or get them from someone else. It's that important. I've actually seen the damage that sunlight can do to unprotected eyes. Wearing sunglasses can actually help protect your sight. They might even make you look good. Every hour, every day, we're helping someone see. Hey. Hey. Hey! You want original? We got original. Brand new show all month. All premiere June on Biography. All this month on A and E. Come here. I'll show you something original. Sunday, A and E gets <laughs> Wilder. I don't like guessing games. With a night of Gene Wilder. That's talent. First, murder in a small town. Get her out of here! Followed by the lady in question. Hit me again. I need love. Cash is back to back. The hell with you! A night of Wilder. Sunday at 8, 7 Central on A and E. Hey, Mozart. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Elijah, I have a test tomorrow. It's believed that learning music early can help kids do better in math and science. So the simple act of learning to carry a tune can carry a kid a long, long way. Early Notes Music Education, proudly sponsored by Texaco. We now return to a murder in Greenwich, the Martha Moxley case. On October 31st, 1975, the brutal murder of 15-year-old Martha Moxley shocked the safe, sheltered city of Greenwich, Connecticut. My mother always says she never knew where the keys to the house were because they never locked it. Uh, people were locking their doors now, being more careful. You're looking over your shoulder. It's just not the way it had been. 
Frightened residents assume that the young girl must have been attacked by an outsider or an outcast. The Greenwich Police Department shared the same suspicions. Despite evidence that seemed to implicate 17-year-old Tommy Skakel, Ethel Kennedy's nephew and the last person known to have seen the victim alive, detectives initially concentrated their investigation on other, less prominent suspects. The first was a 26-year-old graduate student who lived next door to the Moxleys and whose window overlooked the tree under which the teenager's corpse was found. He knew the Moxleys, he'd been, and he knew the Skakels. He'd been to cocktail parties. He had some kind of strange conversation with Martha and also with uh, her mother, Dorothy. So they, they all thought he was... Detective Carroll and his colleagues interrogated the young man for several hours. They obtained a consent to search form, a kind of voluntary search warrant for his home. They scoured his house. They really searched his house well, went through waste baskets, went through the laundry machines. Finally, after being hounded by police for weeks, the suspect passed a polygraph test and was cleared. Though they had not found the killer, Greenwich detectives had shown a willingness to aggressively go after a homicide suspect, a willingness that seemed to disappear in the presence of the powerful Skakels one of the town's most prominent families for three generations. In the days following Martha Moxley's murder, investigators searched relentlessly for a crucial missing piece of evidence, the broken handle of the golf club used to bludgeon the teenage girl. Bellhaven residents allowed police to drain their pools, dredge their ponds, and examine nearly every basement and building in their elite community. Yet even though the Skakels owned the only set of clubs in the neighborhood that matched the brand used in the murder, detectives treated the family with unusual deference. At the time, says retired Fairfield County State's Attorney Donald Brown, Connecticut law prohibited sweeping evidentiary searches. What a lot of people don't realize that back in those days you could not conduct a search for mere evidence. They had no authority to get a search warrant to go in and search for bloody clothing. They had no authority to go in and search for hair in the, in the storm drain. The only thing that they could have gotten a warrant for was the balance of the club that was taken from the removed from the crime scene. And that was all they could have searched for. But police never secured even such a limited search warrant for the Skakel home. Instead, they got the family's permission to search the house and then allowed 18-year-old Julie Skakel to do the looking for them. You don't have any uh, relative of the Skakel family search the house for you. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Along with the consent search, Rushton Skakel Sr. had voluntarily granted Greenwich police officers permission to examine his children's school and medical records. This meant that detectives could pursue certain avenues of investigation, but only as long as Mr. Skakel allowed them to. Initially, he was cooperative, even as detectives began to view his son as a leading suspect. Just hours before Martha Moxley's murder, they learned, Tommy Skakel had received some devastating news. His varsity soccer teammates had unanimously voted to kick him off the team for missing a game. He had left the field in tears. Tommy was a lousy student, but one thing he knew how to do well was play soccer. He was a good athlete. It was the one thing that he could really hang on to and say, I can do this well. The incident led detectives to dig deeper into the teenager's past. We had permission from Mr. Skakel to get any and all information on Tommy. One of the places that I went to was Whitby School. Tommy had attended the private Whitby school several years before. His father was one of its most influential donors. In January 1976, when detectives went to examine Tommy's records, the school's headmaster ordered them to leave. I said, the Skakel boys, plural, must have done some damage here. And I said, did they break statues? I said, worse, I said, they pick on any of the students. And meantime, he's getting louder and louder get out. 
Later that day, Rushton Skakel Sr. went to the Greenwich Police Station and angrily withdrew his voluntary cooperation with the investigation. Though Tommy Skakel still seemed like their strongest suspect, detectives lacked any evidence tying him directly to the crime. Now stonewalled by the Skakel family, their search for Martha Moxley's killer foundered. Once again, the department turned its attention to outsiders. In April, six months after Martha's murder, officers were tipped off to a new suspect, a 23-year-old Williams College graduate named Ken Littleton, who the informant said had been acting erratically. Littleton was a teacher and coach at the Brunswick School, an elite prep school attended by several of the Skakel boys, including Tommy and Michael. Their father had hired Littleton to be the family's live-in babysitter while he was out of town on business. His first night on the job, Martha was murdered. Littleton had stayed at the Skakels for several more weeks. He soon began drinking heavily. When Steve Carroll and his partner tracked him down at a Brunswick football practice, his defensive reaction struck the detectives as strange. He started screaming that he was not going to help us build a case against Tommy Skakel. And we looked at him in amazement and said, you know, that's not our job, that's not what we're looking for. On October 18th, 1976, Littleton failed a police polygraph exam. He also admitted to having been arrested that summer for theft. From that day on, Ken Littleton became one of two prime suspects in the murder of Martha Moxley. The other was Tommy Skakel. But without enough hard evidence to arrest either of them, and lacking any other promising leads, the Greenwich Police Department's investigation went cold for years. In the early 1980s, both Prosecutor Donald Brown and the Greenwich Police Department had come under fire for their failure to bring Martha Moxley's killer to justice. Critics accused them of selling out to the Skakel family, of allowing a relative of the Kennedys to get away with murder. It was a case, they said, reminiscent of another Kennedy controversy, the death of Mary Jo Kopechny at Chappaquiddick. But in 1983, a Greenwich journalist came to a different conclusion. The investigators weren't corrupt, he argued, just incompetent. His charges, suppressed at first, would ultimately lead to a remarkable reassessment of the Moxley case. That story is next on American Justice. What does a sound investment sound like? Janice found a radio network with big plans. So Janice did some high-frequency fact-finding, went out to the stations, sat down with their books and their managers, and found out the stations were doing better than anyone expected. Music to Janice's ears, and proof that tuning into the details can turn up sweet opportunities. Sound good? Get there. Janice Mutual Funds. to get away but then go nowhere at all that change that i've been looking for in a place that's magical where i can hide a place to be myself a one to share where quiet and peace and daydreams live hey how can i get there say hello where to go whatever you want to know ask how ask now ask sherwin williams the number one suspect caught in the act. Drugs were involved, experimental sex. A diary and a videotape <laughs> prompts a startling confession. I could have killed that girl. He's a time bomb. He's waiting to go off. In back-to-back -back episodes of Murder One, tomorrow on a &E. Need a place to golf? AccessLasVegas.com's got local course reviews and other useful things, like local weather and shopping. AccessLasVegas.com, the best local site on the web. Are your talents going to waste? Visit the job channel on AccessLasVegas.com, powered by Headhunter.net. Find a job that makes the most of your talents, or stay right where you are. AccessLasVegas.com, the best local site on the web. You know you need life insurance. Here's how to get started. Call this number. And in five minutes or less, you'll get a free quote on a quality policy from Protective Life Insurance Company.
Less than $10 a month on a $100,000 term life policy for a 35-year-old man. And that rate's guaranteed for 10 years. So call. It's easy. And then you'll rest easier. For your free quote, call Matrix Direct. 1-800-624-8495. We now return to American Justice here on A&E. In 1982, the Greenwich Time hired investigative reporter Len Levitt to look into the murder of Martha Moxley. After seven years, the most widely publicized homicide in the town's history remained unsolved. Yet few details were known about the case, other than that the popular high school sophomore had been beaten with a golf club, then stabbed with the end of its broken shaft. Greenwich police had consistently refused to release information uncovered by their investigation. I persuaded the newspaper there to sue the Greenwich Police Department under the Freedom of Information Act to get the police file on the case. And we won in court and we got about 400 pages of their police report deleted much of the report before turning it over. Levitt was able to combine what remained with his own research to produce a lengthy article on Martha Moxley's murder. Critics had long considered the investigation corrupt, compromised by the influence of the leading suspect's father, Rushton Skakel, the brother of Ethel Kennedy. Levitt reached a different conclusion. There's no dishonesty at all among the Greenwich police in terms of uh, the way they investigated this case. The dishonesty comes in terms of um, not wanting the public to see how uh, badly the case was handled. Levitt's article indicated that Greenwich police had conducted an inept investigation. But for reasons the reporter says were never made clear to him, the paper refused to run the piece. In Levitt's opinion, Editors feared that the article's revelations would ruffle too many feathers in the tight-knit community. Finally, in late 1983, the paper spiked the story altogether, putting it on the shelf where it would sit for the next eight years. In the spring of 1991, another Kennedy cousin, William Kennedy Smith, was accused of raping a woman at the family's estate in West Palm Beach, Florida. And how do you defend yourself from somebody who says the word... His rape. nationally televised trial focused attention on what some saw as the seamy exploits of the Kennedy clan. A tabloid reported that the accused rapist had been visiting the Skakels in Greenwich on October 30th, 1975, the night of Martha's murder. The sensational allegation was quickly proven false. But the media attention it drew transformed the Muxley case from an unsolved murder into yet another Kennedy scandal. Under pressure, the Greenwich Time finally printed the article Len Levitt had written eight years before. Its publication re-energized the long search for Martha Moxley's killer. On August 9, 1991, the Greenwich Police Department and the Connecticut State's Attorney announced that they were jointly reactivating the case. To their new investigating team, they added the state of Connecticut's forensic scientist, Dr. Henry Lee, a world-renowned authority in the emerging field of genetic fingerprinting, or DNA testing. Reportedly shaken by the news that Dr. Lee was now involved, Rushton Skakel and his attorneys hired a high-priced New York detective agency called Sutton Associates, to investigate the investigation. Observers of the case have speculated that Skakel wanted to learn whether any of his kids could be implicated in the murder of Martha Moxley. Some believe that he also hoped his detectives might dig up enough evidence to pin the blame on the other leading suspect in the case, schoolteacher Ken Littleton. But Skakel's strategy seemed to backfire when the agency produced a report claiming that his kids had radically revised their accounts of the night of the murder during interviews with detectives. In 1995, investigative journalist Len Levitt, now with New York Newsday, wrote a series of articles describing the explosive new details contained in the Sutton Associates report, a copy of which he had obtained 
from one of the agency's detectives. Originally, Tommy Skakel had told police he had last been with Martha Moxley around 9.30, the night of her murder. He then went inside to work on a report for school. Now he says, um, well, I, I left her at 9.30, but I came back out again, and we were having uh, sex until about a quarter to 10. According to the Greenwich police, autopsy results indicated that Martha Moxley was a virgin when she was killed. By sex, Tommy explained, he meant that he and Martha had masturbated each other. The story placed him with the girl right at the time police believed the murder had taken place. If Tommy's reported new account was startling, his younger brother's was simply bizarre. For two decades, Michael Skakel had never been considered a suspect. His alibi, supported by a cousin and two of Michael's brothers, seemed ironclad. After leaving the Skakel house at 9.30 to drop off the cousin, the three boys returned around 11.20 and went right up to bed. But according to the Sutton Associates report, Michael now admitted that he hadn't gone to bed, that he'd left the house 20 minutes later and wandered around the neighborhood. After passing through the Moxley's yard, the report said Michael climbed the tree outside Martha's bedroom, threw pebbles at her window, and shouted the girl's name. When she didn't answer, he masturbated in the tree, climbed down, and ran home. It is the whopper of all evidentiary cover stories. Martha wasn't there, so I masturbated in the tree. This is strange behavior by strange people. The reported new version of Michael's activities that night placed him everywhere the victim had been, from the spot where she had first been attacked to the tree where her body was discovered. The investigating detectives cannot understand why Michael would put himself at that murder scene. And that has made them very suspicious coming on top of the so-called admissions that he made about his involvement. Levitt believes that the forensic technology of the 1990s had forced Tommy and Michael Skakel to amend alibis they'd maintained since the 1970s. Now why would they come up with changing stories unless they feared that they did leave some semen or DNA uh, at the scene, unless it was to cover themselves? If the Skakels had let this alone, they wouldn't be in the hot water there and today. The Skakels themselves have done the best job of making the Skakels look guilty. In January 1994, the team of forensic scientists that had been charged with re-examining physical evidence from the murder announced that the results of its two-year investigation were inconclusive. But along the way, Rushton Skakel Sr. had inadvertently turned up the heat on his own family. Next on A&E, new evidence, new theories, and for the first time, a grand jury investigation. The phone is your playing field. Connect to the world. Access the web. You have the power to do it all. Right in the palm of your hand. And the sound of your voice takes you anywhere you want to go. Michael. Hey, coach. We did it. Wireless. Digital. Samsung. Everyone's invited. You lost the address? Relax, honey. Listen, can the testosterone and let's call for direction. The house has a new metal roof. It'll stick out like... like... Yeah, like your butt in a bathing suit. <laughs> That's it. Oh, that... that was it. That was a metal roof. Take a look at the new metal roofing. Call 1-888-METAL-ROOF for a free video. That's a metal roof? This social security measure. In 1935, FDR helped millions retire with less worry. Today, we're picking up where he left off. Presenting the Retirement Income Manager from T. Rowe Price. If you're retired or about to, this unique advisory service can help you determine how much of your retirement savings you can comfortably spend each month for the rest of your life. Something you don't want to get wrong. That's why the Retirement Income Manager was developed. Using advanced computer analysis, it factors in hundreds of different market scenarios to give you income plan options appropriate to your goals and priorities. 
And to help you identify an income plan that best meets your needs, our own retirement counselors will work with you. If you're retired or about to, call T. Rowe Price at 1-800-333-5061 and find out how you can retire with less worry these days. The Retirement Income Manager, only from T. Rowe Price. The number one suspect caught in the act. Drugs were involved, experimental sex. A diary and a videotape prompts a startling confession. I could have killed that girl. He's a time bomb. Just waiting to go off. In back-to-back -back episodes of Murder One, tomorrow on A&E. A tradition, a celebration, an A&E special live presentation. Salute the Force with Keith Lockhart and the Boston Pops Esplanade Orchestra. And join special guests Don McLean, Linda Etter, and Arturo Sandoval as the night ignites in a star-spangled symphony of music and light. It's a flag-waving, fire-cracking fanfare that can't be topped. Pops Goes the Fourth, July 4th on A&E. And now the conclusion of a murder in Greenwich, the Martha Moxley case. In the spring of 1998, former LAPD detective Mark Furman published Murder in Greenwich, Who Killed Martha Moxley? The book was a scathing assessment of the Greenwich Police Department's investigation into the 1975 slaying. Furman had been introduced to the case during the O.J. Simpson trial by author Dominic Dunn, who had written a thinly disguised novel about the killing of a teenage girl in a wealthy Connecticut town. The controversial detective examined the public record and then did a little investigating of his own. When he finished, Furman had come to an explosive conclusion. Martha Moxley's killer was not Tommy Skakel, as police had reportedly suspected for more than two decades, but his younger brother, Michael. According to Furman's theory, the two siblings were both attracted to the beautiful girl next door. The night of the murder, Furman wrote, Michael fell into a jealous frenzy after seeing Martha and his older brother together. As she left the Skakel house, sometime after 11 p.m., Furman believes Michael followed her into the yard. He grabs a golf club, and in a fit of rage, he chases after Martha. Martha gets almost home. She turns around, he hits her. Maybe he doesn't realize how hard he hit her, uh, but she goes down, she's unconscious. Now, the rage is still there. He grabs her by the ankles, drags her face down 46 feet by a small Japanese elm tree, and uh, commences to beat her with the golf club. According to Furman, Michael left the girl for a time after the attack. When he came back, Furman contends she was barely alive, lying in a widening pool of her own blood. To have a pool of blood, you know, two and a half, three feet wide, would take a significant amount of time probably more than a half hour. Feeling a combination of fear and fury, Michael finished her off, Furman believes, stabbing her through the neck with the shaft of the broken six iron. He then dragged her body beneath a pine tree in the Moxley's yard, leaving it to be found by a neighbor the next day. The specifics of the scenario Furman sketched out were controversial and, to many observers, off the mark. There's a difference in writing a book that outlines what the case was about and going on TV and saying, I solved the murder. The only problem is you can't believe anything he says. You can't put him on a witness stand. But even those who disagree with the detective concede that his theory has thrown into question long-standing assumptions about the case. For two decades, police had publicly indicated that the murder took place between 9.30 and 10 p.m., when Dorothy Moxley and others heard a sudden commotion outside her house. Drawing on blood evidence from the scene, as well as the changing stories of the Skakel boys themselves, Furman raised the possibility that the attack may have occurred later than previously believed. And by questioning the time of the murder, he also drew suspicion away from Tommy Skakel and cast it onto Michael. The impact of Furman's book was magnified by the publication, just three weeks before, of journalist Tim Dumas's own account of the case, Greentown. 
A lifelong Greenwich resident, Dumas had been a year behind Martha in the city's public schools. The, the Moxley murder was sort of the, the great mystery of my youth, and, and that's what I tried to address by writing this book. In Greentown, Dumas wrote about a rumor that had been going around Greenwich for years, that the Skakel family had paid off state's attorney Donald Brown in order to avoid prosecution. The author found no evidence that this rumor was true, but he remained highly critical of Brown's handling of the politically explosive case. My feeling about Donald Brown was that he was honest, uh, but that he was very cautious, overly cautious. He had what he needed to get a grand jury convened, and he chose not to do it. Brown believes his caution was justified. I was always hoping that that little piece of, that, that, that unknown item was going to surface and that we could go ahead and accomplish something. But the criticisms in Greentown stung the state's attorney. Just days after the book was published, he resigned from the case. I was an asset to the investigation and I was willing to stay on until the Dumas book came out. You know, the funny thing is, I never ever met a live Skakel. The best thing that ever happened to us was when he bowed out. For 23 years, Donald Brown had been the only prosecutor assigned to the Moxley murder. On June 17, 1998, less than two months after he left the case, his replacement convened a grand jury to investigate Martha Moxley's murder. The grand jury's work is expected to be completed later this year. But its efforts have been hampered by legal challenges from potentially valuable witnesses, including 74-year-old Rushton Skakel Sr., who his lawyers claim is medically unable to testify. Though the grand jury investigation proceeds in secret, observers believe that Tommy and Michael Skakel remain its primary targets. At least one witness reportedly testified that Michael confessed to the murder during a stint at a drug and alcohol abuse rehab school in the late 70s. Michael's lawyer scoffs at such allegations. This kind of a case brings out the nuts, the crackpots, the hanger honors anonymous callers who think that somebody from, uh, you know, the planet Jupiter did this. I can tell you that he is categorically denied from day one ever being involved in this tragedy. And nothing has changed in that regard. Martha Moxley's family has been haunted by her murder for almost 25 years. Just before Thanksgiving 1988, Martha's father, David, died of a heart attack at the age of 57. Family members believe that Martha's killing contributed to his untimely death. I think it probably chewed him up on the inside. I mean, it had to have... I'm just now starting to have an inkling of what it might be like since I had my own children to lose one this way. Um, and I can't imagine anything more devastating. Since her husband's death, Dorothy Moxley has devoted her life to the search for her daughter's killer. The recent publicity about the case has only fueled her passion. For two decades, she had managed to avoid the grisly details of Martha's murder. Following advice from police, neither she nor her husband ever viewed their daughter's brutally beaten and stabbed body. But the resigned acceptance she had long felt was transformed by the vivid descriptions of the murder and the two recent accounts of the case. After the books came out and we realized how savage it was, then it has turned to anger. I mean, I'm just, I'm really angry now. Very angry. And with the grand jury expected to wrap up its work by the end of the year, Dorothy Moxley clings to the belief that the mystery of Martha's murder may soon be solved. I really hope that there will be a, a trial, a conviction, and I hope this person is sent to jail for a long, long time. Last winter, the Moxley Grand Jury finished its work, and murder charges were filed against Michael Skakel. A week ago, a hearing began in Connecticut to determine whether the 39-year-old Skakel should be tried as a juvenile or an adult. If he is convicted as an adult, he could face 25 years to life. For American Justice, I'm Bill Curtis. <laughs>